morning. Uh, can we go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 4? Ephesians chapter 4. Start off reading verses 1 through 3. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And then out of Ephesians chapter 1, in Ephesians 1, toward the end of the chapter, it's Paul's first prayer in this letter. We're not going to read the whole prayer, but there'll be a, we'd like to read a couple of verses. They're more or less the heart of the prayer. It's Ephesians 1, verses 18 and 19. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. And then back over to Ephesians chapter 3. This is generally referred to as Paul's second prayer. He he actually has a few little prayers scattered throughout this letter, but there's a couple of bigger ones that get referred to most of the time. Ephesians 3, starting in verse 14 to the end of the chapter. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord, we do rejoice that we have had this opportunity to remember, Lord, you at your table. We're thankful for who you are, that giver. We're thankful for the gift you gave. We're thankful for the privilege we have. In an unhindered way, we can respond and give you the thanks. And Lord, we come to your word in a similar spirit. You are the very giver of those words of life. You've given us that great gift of your son in the living word. And we too want to be giving you our hearts to receive, Lord, the words that you have for us. Lord, we're thankful that you still speak to us. We see the, the days we're living in, and it just points us more and more to your soon return. So how we want to have ears to hear this day what the Spirit says to the churches. In thy name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I previously shared out of Ephesians chapter 4, those first few verses there, about being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And love is that perfect bond of unity, as it says in Colossians. And as we are all very much aware, the unity of believers is very much under attack in these days. There's a lot, there are a lot of things going on in the periphery, but the heart of the issue is there's a great battle over the unity of believers. There's a battle over the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ among the people of God. And we're thankful that God has made a provision for us in Christ to be diligent to preserve that unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And as I was considering this, it led me to Paul's second prayer there in Ephesians chapter 3 that we first read. And the burden of that prayer was that the saints, that we would all live in the fullness of what God has given to us, the fullness that he has for us. And the key in that full, living in that fullness was the love of Christ. Now we know also that in this first prayer that we read, how Paul, as he prayed for the church, he prayed that the eyes of the hearts would be enlightened. And these two prayers, uh, they're very different. 
but they really complement each other and they enhance. You can't have one of these prayers without the other if you want to enter into the fullness of God's heart. That first prayer is praying that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened. We would know what God's purpose is. We would know His heart, His desire, His great plan. And the second is that we would be, the second prayer is that by the love of Christ we would be captured in such a way that it would become reality, experiential reality. The words in that first prayer when it talks about knowing, it, it's really just knowing uh, intellectually, we can say. Uh, it's two different Greek words between the first prayer and then knowing in the second prayer. That knowing in the second prayer is experiencing the reality of it. Not just a concept, but entering into the experience and the reality of it. And how's that done? It's all by grace. It's by the love of Christ. Uh, there's a couple of people who have compared these two prayers, and if we could put that first slide up. There's a brother, Robert Govett, and when he summarizes uh, these two prayers uh, in a very succinct way, he says that first prayer spoke of the eyes of our heart being enlightened to know God's plan. And he says the second is Christ dwelling in our hearts to give the knowledge of his love. He says light is good. Obviously we need that light that enlightenment. But fullness of power, fullness of knowledge of the love of Christ is better. How we need the, the two of these mixed, mixed together, flowing together in a oneness. Too often we approach things as an either or situation. Whereas in Christ they're inclusive. They're both. You can't have one without the other. If we want the fullness of Christ. We need that vision. But we also need the love of Christ. One without the other, is not, there's not a complete fullness of Christ. There's another dear saint, a sister named Ruth Paxson, uh, as she compares the two prayers on the next slide. In that first prayer, she says, you have revelation, enlightenment, and light. But in the second prayer, you have a realization, an enablement, and life. Not just to, not just to have a revelation, but have a realization of that revelation. Not just to have enlightenment, but able to have an enablement to enter into the fullness of that. And not just light, but life. That's what our Lord is after. <clears throat> and so we see how, to me, as you, these summaries provide to us one of the keys that unlocks the whole book of Ephesians. And to see the real heart of God. We're thankful how, in the first three chapters of the letter to the church in Ephesus, Paul very clearly lays out, God's eternal purpose in his heart uh, in a very uh, in a way that uh, has been amazing us for years and years and God's call upon our lives of Christ and the church and but the question is often asked how do we enter into this we can see the concept we can hear the teaching and we can know it but how do we enter into it we enter into it by knowing that the experiential way of the love of Christ being lived within our hearts. That love which surpasses knowledge. It's not that knowledge is not important, but knowledge in and of itself is not the end. It's leading us into the fullness of everything that he wants expressed through his life. You know, we're very thankful. We've been so blessed that over the years, uh, we've heard much about God's eternal purpose. We've heard much about the need for vision, for revelation, and, and we pray for that. But you know, we have to ask ourselves, uh, we're thankful for what of that, the portion of that that we've experienced, but why haven't we entered into more of it? Why haven't we entered into more of the fullness of what God is after in this day and time? And I think the key to that is found in this whole matter of the love of Christ. The more that love, the love of Christ captures our hearts, the more we'll be entering in to what's upon his heart and what's upon his desire. And the more that we can be those that are really captured by him, we'll be entering into that. It's interesting, uh, as I was thinking about this matter of the love of Christ, it's obviously, it's that Greek word agape. And agape can be a noun, the love of Christ. It can be a verb, Christ loved us and died for us. Uh, I'm an accountant, so I have to sp explain nouns and verbs to people and other accountants in the room. So, But we see how... Uh, I'm not picking on you. I know you're just a guest. <laughs> Wrong timing on that one. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're, we're thankful how, the, how this, this thought of agape, that divine love. Uh, so it made me think, 
Which of Paul's writings did he use agape the most? And I, my first thought went to 1 Corinthians. He had that great chapter on love. And in 1 Corinthians, you have 16 long chapters there. And actually, in 1 Corinthians, Paul uses the agape in either a noun or a verb 16 times. And then um, I said, well, maybe it's, maybe Rome, let's look at Romans. Because there we see how that love of, we see the great love that he brought about so great a salvation. And love is used in Romans 17 times in that, those 16 chapters there. But in this little book of Ephesians, only six chapters compared to those other two big ones of 16 chapters. In these little six chapters, agape is used 20 times. If you tried to carry that out, that would make it, if you compare that to Ephesians or Corinthians, it'd be over 40 times. But we see how just in this six little chapters, he uses this word that describes his divine love over 20 times. And to me, that really showed me something of the very essence and heart of what God was after for the fullness of his purpose and the fullness of the life of his son and that corporate expression to be made manifest. The key to it is his love working in all of our hearts, in all of our lives. And without that love of Christ coming into our hearts and lives, there's not going to be that fullness that he's so jealous for and that he's after. It, and the more I thought about it, the, the key and how much he poured his heart on this matter of love into the church of Ephesus, it also shed a little more light of how when, Paul, when John was writing uh, what the Lord instructed him to in Revelation 2 about those in Ephesus, you know, they had the knowledge, they had the works, they had all the good deeds, but what did they left? They left their first love. The very thing that Paul had poured into them over and over again, 20 some times, this was the thing that they ended up leaving. They had much uh, that they had been doing, much that they were faithful in, but they'd, they'd left their first love. And just seeing how Paul had related that to them in such a wonderful way over and over, it, uh, it shed new light on Ephesians about leaving the first love and the vital nature of it in the days and times that we're living in in specific where there's such a battle for this. You know, I was thinking about Paul's life also, even in this regard, how we know in Acts chapter 9, Paul had that dramatic conversion experience on that road to Damascus, and he, he saw the Lord, and he, the Lord showed him such a, he revealed himself to him, and many refer to that as a heavenly vision that Paul had. And then we see later how he writes on the fullness of this vision uh, in the letter to the church in Ephesus. But what happened between Acts chapter 9 and the time that Paul wrote that letter to the church in Ephesus some years later? One of the keys that we see is out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul shares a wonderful testimony of what controls his life. And since we've been studying that, I will, most will already know it, but I'll read it again. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The very issue that controlled Paul's life was the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. He died for all that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. The love of Christ controlled Paul. And what the love of Christ did within Paul's life, it took that vision that he had on a road to Damascus, and it brought about a full revelation, a realization of all that God had for his people. That vision that he had, that love of Christ coming together, brought about that revelation that Paul was no longer living for himself, that he was no longer just doing his own thing but he was living for the one who loved and died for him. Paul's not speaking of his love for Christ. We know Paul had a love for Christ, but our love has ends and bounds. But he was speaking of the love of Christ. So that love of Christ controlled Paul in such a way that he was able to enter in to the fullness. He was able to enter in to, and to write about this surpassing knowledge, this surpassing love, 
all of the, the superlative words that he used all throughout the church in Ephesus, uh, that letter to the church in Ephesus. You know, I think Paul, even through those, what he was seeing, he saw that he was still just seeing in part. There were things far beyond. And there was so much more. And it was creating within him a jealousy, as he writes about in Philippians, of pressing on to know him more and more. That jealousy that Paul had to press on came out of experiencing the love of Christ in his heart. And it drove him into a fuller and greater revelation of himself. So with, with this background on um, kind of the, the second prayer of Paul's uh, in the letter to the church in Ephesus, I want to go into the, some of those specific verses of that chapter a little more detail. And I guess the first question, we're talking a lot about the love of Christ. And you know, what is the love of Christ? Well, <laughs> many have said throughout the years that if you, you try to define it, you confine it because the love of Christ really can't be defined. And so what we end up doing is trying to describe it. It's a love that uh, descri you start to describe it, and you can't fully describe it, but it's a love that left the splendor of heaven. It's a love that out of a heart for his Father, a heart for mankind, a heart for his church, he left all the splendor and the beauty of heaven. And it was a love that enabled him the love that kept him, a love that enabled him to go through all of the humiliation of being born in a Bethlehem, of suffering the humility of being born in a manger that gets so glorified in a few next month or so. But we see how there was a, that love allowed him, gave he took that grace to go through the humiliation. It was a love that enabled him to go through those hidden years of Nazareth. Those hidden, those, most of his life upon this earth is hidden. We don't know much about it. But there was a love that kept him. Because we know within him we could just imagine. I shouldn't say we know. We can imagine that he's just bursting forth to really to be about his father's business. But he also knew that it's when his time was to come. So he had that desire to really be all that the Lord had called him to be upon this earth. That love held him in a hidden way. You know, we self in the flesh hates to be hidden. We want to, if anybody had a message to be t told to the nations, it was Christ. But he had to be hidden. You know, sometimes we have something we want to share, and we have to go. We maybe we're hidden away for a while, set aside. Paul had to be set aside for a while. Moses had to be set aside for a while. Are we willing, is the love of Christ constraining us in such a way we're willing to be hidden? Or do we have to be seen and have to be known in such a way? It was a love that enabled him to go through the rejection there in Judea, where it says that it, he came to his own and his own received him not. It was a love that held him through rejection. I mean, when we're rejected, what's our first thought? Revenge? Or is a love of love holding us through those times of rejection? It was a love that held him through times of misunderstanding. When, when he would be sharing and he was so misunderstood, was so mistreated, it was a love that held him through that. It was a love that held him through Gethsemane of being able to pray, not my will, but thy will be done. It was that love, that love within his heart that enabled him to go to Calvary, to suffer and die, that humiliation there. It was a love that also raised him to the throne in victory. Praise God. That love of Christ doesn't end at Calvary. The love of Christ, it ends on that throne in the victory. And that's what we've been brought into. There's many, sometimes in this world, people talk about love and they paint it in such a beautiful, uh, uh, I'll call it in modern day terms, snowflake type issue. You know, it's a, no problems. Love, love is great. You'll never have any problems. You know, don't, if you, if you get hurt, it's not love, love. But no, you look at the love of Christ. There's rejection, there's humiliation, there's suffering. All that we could come into the fullness of it, of what he's called us to. That's the love. When we talk about this love, love of Christ, it, it's, not a, it's not a thing. It's Christ himself. Christ himself, he's the personification of God's love. And that's what we're desiring to be. That's what he desires his church to be. 
He, he desires that we would be brought in to being the very personification of his love seen upon this earth in day and time. So I'd like as we look at this uh, second prayer, I'm going to read again uh, four verses from 16 to 19 because this is what we want to really focus on. This is Paul's prayer. And really in verse 16, you really see Paul's great burden for those in Ephesus, that Christ would increase within them, that they would decrease. He prays that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. The whole issue that Paul was after in this was that within the inner man, within our li that life of Christ within us, that, that battle over who's in control of our life, that through his spirit, that power dwelling within us, we would decrease and he would increase. Not that we might, but as John the Baptist said, we must decrease and he must increase. This is the burden in this prayer. And as he continues, he says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length, height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. When he talks about Christ dwelling in our hearts, this... Uh, this Greek word for dwelling, it's not a visitor. It's making a permanent residence there. It's taking up home. It's somebody that lives there permanently. It's not somebody just coming in for a brief visit. But this is Christ living as the permanent master of our hearts and within our lives. And that in that, with him being really master within our lives, that we would be rooted and grounded in love. Now, I, when we think about rooted and grounded in love, you know, it's his love that he's wanting us to be rooted and grounded in. He's not talking about being rooted and grounded in works, rooted and grounded in knowledge or doctrine, but it's his love. The very love of Christ being lived within us is to be root, that, well, that's what we're to be rooted and grounded in. When you think about rooted, you, you obviously you think about something living, a plant or trees or things like that. And what are the roots for? The roots go down into that rich soil, and they draw forth nutrients from that soil. They draw forth living water from that soil so that they can grow and bear fruit. There's a, there's a going down and bearing fruit upward. Remember the parable of the sower? After the seed was sown, what was the issue within each one? It had to do with their roots. Either they ended up developing no roots, or there was shallow roots, or their tangle roots. It was that roots going down. And the more we go down into the love of Christ, the more we allow that life within a, him to, to go down and that we'd be rooted and grounded in it, there's that drawing forth, forth of nutrients. There's that coming forth of the fruit of the Spirit, that coming forth of the fruit of his life, because that's what it's all about. And it's also, when you speak of a plant and the fruit, the fruit isn't for the plant, it's always for others. It's always for others. And that's what Christ, the very life of Christ, it's, it was always for others. You know, sadly, I know in my own life, my life a lot of times is for me. And that's why I think I've been touched so much by this love of Christ, because I'm, I'm tired of living for me. I want to be living for him more and more. And then it speaks of being grounded, or some translations talk about being founded. And this, this speaks of a foundation of a building. Now, why, do, why does a building even need a foundation? I, I've got uh, four S's, okay? They needs a foundation for strength, for security, for support, and stability. And uh, I'm not going to touch much more on foundations because we have an expert over here who can handle it. And uh, we've heard through the years about the necessity of a foundation. But we need that, that foundation. It provides strength. And it provides security, stability during the storms of life. It's interesting when uh, these huge hurricanes come. Where do you see the people that are the weather people? They're either on a parking deck or they're in some very secure building. They're not out. Most of them aren't standing by a mobile home to uh, watch a tornado come. They're, they're, pretty, they're somewhere else, okay? Uh, and it, the thing about it, too, it, it's normally hidden, but it's supporting the whole structure. It's carrying the weight 
of the whole structure. That's what the love of Christ is doing. It's carrying the whole weight. It carries all of our weight. It keeps us stable through any storm. It provides us the security, the strength that we need. That grounded speaks of that place of security, of stability, of safety that we have in Christ. Do you ever stop and think of that, that secure, the secure love we have in Him? If you do, go over to Romans 8. Romans 8, starting about, I think it's verse 35. <clears throat> it, the question is asked, who can separate us from the love of Christ? And it goes through the, this wonderful exposition. And the, but the bottom line is absolutely nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And that's the, that's the secure place we have. You know, tragically today, <clears throat> we're not, most, many believers, uh, I've been convicted myself, we're not taking the time to get being rooted and grounded in Him. And that's why as it talks about in uh, Ephesians also, how when every little wind of doctrine comes along, oh, here's a new teaching, we can go over here, oh, here's a new teaching, or a natural disaster, or something comes along like a pandemic, we get, we, we get wiped out of this. Brothers and sisters, the Lord in His great love is wanting us to be rooted and grounded in Him. Allowing that love to really nourish us. Allowing that love to strengthen us. Allowing that love to flourish us. That in the midst of the storm, we would be the people that are a testimony unto Him. I love after the, when the weather stations always go back after a, a huge hurricane. And they'll find one building or maybe even a, a strong tree or they'll, they'll point out something where you've got one house standing or one tree standing and everything else is destroyed and fainted away. Would that be our testimony in the midst of the storm? And it was not I, but it was Christ that through the tragedies of all that we're going through in this day, we would, be, we would have our roots so rooted and grounded in Him that we could stand and be the testimony that He's calling us to be in this hour. That's a great need among believers. That's why I've appreciated how in, in recent days there's been such a more and more of an emphasis on praying for the church. Uh, the, the election has awakened us in many ways, but uh, to me the, the thing, that the beauty about it is I see so many believers praying over more so intently in these days. And there's like a, there's a, a, a reviving of prayer among God's people. And my prayer is that it doesn't fade away after Tuesday. You know, we need to be praying just as hard after Tuesday, regardless of what the results are, just as hard for God's testimony and God's people after Tuesday as we do today, before Tuesday. That's what His, because we're seeking for His kingdom to come. And that's, that's the real prayer. So I'll encourage you. Let's be here tonight. <laughs> we get a chance to pray. Uh, I wasn't able to be here last week, but I'm planning on being here tonight. So... Uh, let me see, that was verse 17, just a little advertisement there. But uh, we'll come back to verse 18 in a minute. Look again at verse 19, where it says, To know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of Christ. You know, I, I appreciate how you know, Paul, he prays this, and he says that you would, you would know the love of Christ. And this knowing here, this is the experiential knowing. It's not just a head knowledge but you have experienced this in life. To me, that's the testimony of Paul in Romans 8. When he talks about nothing separating him from the love of Christ, he does, he's not just waxing poetically beauty in, in some way through that, uh, but he's, what he's talking about is things that he's been through and experienced in life. He knows that there's nothing that can separate him from the love of Christ. And that's how we can enter into that fullness of Christ. It's interesting, uh, Paul actually uses a, a paradoxical term, how he's praying for us to know something that surpasses knowledge. And what he's really trying to just get our attention is that we would be those that are experiencing this more and more. Don't wait till we have a full apprehension of it, comprehension of it, but just that we would be experiencing it and allowing it to develop more and more. I was thinking about it as like a, a child knowing the parents love. When a child grows up in a home, um, they, they can't really comprehend or know the full love that a parent has for them. Uh, they just know that they, they have this sensing, they have a feeling, their, their, 
parents love them. They might not even know what the word is, but they know there's a place of security. There's a place of safety. There's a place of comfort. There's a place where they can grow in this environment of love that the parents are, do, are providing for them. And because of that, they, you know, they, can, they can grow in love, even though they don't fully comprehend the parents' love. Quite often, I mean, I didn't know how much my parents loved me until I was about 30 years old, and I started looking back. You know, when I was growing up, what, what they called love, I didn't think was very lovely. <laughs> of course, some of it was brought on myself but, by my actions. But, uh, but it was, you can look back and you can see the great love that parents have. And that many of the ways, that's the way we grow in Christ. We don't fully comprehend it. We don't fully apprehend everything, of this love. But there's this, we've, we've touched different aspects of it. And we grow in that. And we continue to, to grow in it in a fuller and greater way. And though, because that's what leads us into the fullness of Christ. That full expression of who he is and everything. So it's a powerful life. It's a powerful love that we've been brought into. And how he's so jealous for it. So if we go back to verse 18, we pray, he prays here that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length, height and depth. Now, you know, English scholars have a difficulty with this uh, particular verse because it's kind of it's called a dangling word, a little dangling phrase there. What is the breadth and length and height and depth? And then it just stops. And then, so that gives all of the expositors and all the commentators great delight in debating about what this, what is the, the breadth and length and height and depth that he's really talking about here. Now, some will say it's speaking about God's purpose, God's eternal purpose. And that's true. I mean, when you start to think of all that God has within his purpose, within his, his realm, within his desire, there's, there, there, there isn't, there's a breadth and a length and a height and a depth to it that is beyond comprehension. And others will say that it relates to the love of Christ. Um, and it talks about, and that's true too, the breadth, the length, and the height and depth of his love. But again, to me, it's not an either-or question. There, it's, it speaks of both of them because they're interrelated. I mean, why is the love of Christ so critical? The love of Christ is so critical for us so that we can enter into the fullness of God's heart and purpose. If we don't, if we don't have the, the fullness of, but if we don't have love, if we only have God's heart, if we only have that teaching, if we just have the knowledge of it, all we have is a concept, all we have is a teaching, all we have is a, a, maybe even just an idol of some concept. But once that fullness of his heart comes in that's what we're brought into because um, you go into verse 19 and it talks about uh, two and to the life and then it, it says the length height and depth <clears throat> and to know the love of Christ and the the Greek people tell us that that word too is some different other word that makes it it should be also as it talking about something else so we can't be absolutely sure here, and that's good, that this is only speaking of the love of Christ or only speaking of that. But we're going to look at it today as the aspect of the love of Christ because it's, I believe it speaks of both of them. So with that long explanation, which most people probably didn't even need, uh, but when you start getting all bogged down in these things, you start. it's amazing how... Even when you look at the love of Christ, how the, some commentators can make such an argument over I, I think, uh, don't, ever, don't anybody ever write a commentary? You know, unless you like to argue with people or debate. Maybe Daniel could. He, likes, he loves debating. You know? So you can write another comment. I'll pick on Daniel and embarrass him, and he'll, he'll have to forgive me because he loves me. All right. <laughs> but as you look at this verse, one of the things that caught me was how it speaks of how comprehending with all the saints and and I think that is so critical because no one saint can comprehend the fullness of Christ no one assembly can comprehend the fullness of Christ do we ever stop and really think about how much our Lord wants this uh, relationship 
this love of Christ that he, he died for us. Do we ever stop and think about it? He, how he's so jealous for this relationship with his bride. There's a love that motivated him. Have we ever stopped and see the significance of that love and how we've been brought into this? We talk about that bride being made ready. How is it made ready? It's by the love of Christ working within our hearts and lives. You know, when Adam first saw Eve, he said, that's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. I believe that when the, the bride being made ready is not talking so much, it won't be so much about bone of bone and flesh of flesh, but it will be heart to heart. There will be a love relationship there. And it, it, that marriage will be the full consummation and culmination of all that love. But that, there's a love that, for the same thing. The love of that, that bride's love for what the, the Lord is after. The bride's love for the love of Christ. They'll, they'll come, get merged more and more into a oneness, into all that he's desiring. This is what he's after. And we've experienced some of it. We want, we want to experience it so much more. In this verse, Paul, as he starts to describe and speak of the love of Christ, he, he uses words that we, call, we would call measurements breadth and length and height and depth. And now, it doesn't apply that God can be measured. Don't anybody think that there's a breadth, a length, a height, and a depth to him. No. What it's showing us is the vastness of his love. Uh, it just shows us how it's beyond measure. There's a vastness to it. Now, naturally, we love to put God or God and his love in a box and say, this is how God operates. This is his love. We do it unconsciously, or sometimes consciously. But most of us, we, when we think of having a concept of how God works, we have a little box. This is how he works in here. And then when something operates outside that box, we, don't, we can't see it. We don't know it. We, we don't recognize it. But God in this hour, in the day we're living in, you know what he's doing? He's shattering all of our little boxes. And praise God for that because that's setting us free to serve him and to love him in a fuller and greater way. I, as I was considering this, I was um, actually listening one night, and I heard this uh, one, a person was sharing, and they asked the question, is there anything God can't do? And my initial reaction was, no, God can do all things. You know, he's all powerful. He can do everything. And their answer was, there's one thing that God can't do, and that is to love you any more than he already does. God cannot love any of us any more than he already does. By our good works, we can't gain or earn any more of his love. Now, his love should produce good works. His love should be, love wants to be expressed, but our works don't make him love us anymore. And by our sinning or neglecting or disobeying him, he doesn't love us any less. It might grieve us, it might grieve him, it might hurt him, but he doesn't change anything toward us. He can never love us any more than he has already done. He was loved us from eternity past, he loves us to eternity future. That's the same. And that's in one way, that's a hard thing for our natural self man to to accept, uh, to know that God can't love me anymore. I mean, we always feel like I've got to do something to earn more. If I do this, he'll, he'll love me more. No. God can't love us anymore. Can we accept that? Do we know, and do we know that we're accepted in the beloved. That's a whole other message. We won't go there. But just to see how this great love he has for us. You know who shared that? It was Joyce Meyer. Now, I'm not endorsing her ministry, but I'm not writing it off either. But she's a sister, and I deserve to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace until we all attain to the unity of the faith. And, we can, we, and I just, uh, that thought has really uh, meant something to me that she shared. Now, when we think of God's love, to me, one of the greatest displays of God's love has been 2020. I think uh, 2020, this whole year, I've been so thankful for it. 
it has shown us the greatest, one of the greatest displays of God's love in recent time. And do you know why that is? Because he's shaking us to get our attention, shaking us to set us free from the things that are hindering us from loving him in a fuller way, shaking us from uh, getting settled down to being so comfortable and complacent. You know, and uh, it was uh, shaking us with a pandemic, shaking us with lawlessness, shaking us with all the natural disasters, shaking us with the election. Everything that kind of like whatever can be shaken is going to be shaken. And we, we're all getting shaken out. If one of them doesn't get you, the other one does. Out of your comfort zone, whatever you were comfortable in, it's being shaken. Things you like to do, don't like to do, that's being shaken. Our concepts are being shaken. Even our religious concepts, our, our economic security is being shaken. It, it, everything is being shaken because he has a desire that we not find any security in anything else than him. And he's giving us this opportunity to draw closer to him and come to him and bring forth a growth of our life within him. You know, when we, we go through all of these uh, various shakings, we see what comes out. There comes out fear. There comes out uncertainty. There comes out anxiety. And like I said, we have to do things we don't like to do. We feel helpless. We feel frustrated. We can, our minds wonder of all, go into all the what ifs. So what if this happens or what if that happens? And we're, we find out that many things that we've experienced in the past are changing. And we're not comfortable with change. But God has said, I want your, my comfort, I want, I want to be your comfort. And I want all of your comfort to be in me. It's really testing our hearts. Even it tests our hearts for the gospel. How about, you know, we see so many people out there rioting and protesting. And I do draw a distinction between rioting and protesting. But it's those ones that are out there rioting. Uh, what do you feel for them? Are you angry? Are you disgusted? Or do you have compassion and praying for them for the gospel? You may have all, all three feelings at the same time. <laughs> But we've got to make sure the gospel is in there. <laughs> That's the heart. That's the love of Christ that we need to be being brought into. These, uh, the circumstances of this year have brought to light, for, for many of us, um, things that we weren't even conscious of, various thoughts, various opinions, various preferences, prejudices, all of this. Things are coming to light. We've had, in, we always have injustice, but now all of these injustices are coming to light. And they touch many areas in our life. But this is where the love of Christ wants to be shed abroad in our hearts. And as we look at this love of Christ, at the breadth and length and height and depth of it, uh, we want to consider it for a minute on how the different ways that it impacts our hearts and lives. So, got another slide up here on the breadth. When we think of the breadth of God's love or the love of Christ, it's broad as the entire human race. He died for all. Can he even mention John 3.16 this morning? There's a, there's that, that's the breadth that reaches to the unlovely. It reaches to a Judas. It reaches to a Hitler. It reaches to a Bin Laden. It reaches to murderers. It reaches to abortionists, to rapists, addicts, on and on. You can make... And it reaches its reach to every one of us. There's no limit to the breadth of his love. He, he loves all mankind. He, God so loved the world, the whole world, not just the good part of it. He, di he li died for all. Well, how about the, the breadth of the love of Christ in us? Who does it reach to? Does it reach beyond our family? Does it reach beyond our circle of friends? Does it reach beyond these four walls? Is our love of Christ confined within these four walls? Or is it reached beyond maybe a, a circle of assemblies that we're involved in? Does the love of Christ in our hearts reach to all the saints? It finds us out. It finds us out pretty quickly. And that's the beauty, the glory of things that are shaking this year. That the love of Christ would really be. There would be a breadth of it expressed through the people of God. What is the testimony of Jesus? What is the church? It's the expression of his life. And his life has a breadth to it. His love has that breadth to it to reach all of mankind. And all of the saints, not just ones who believe like we do, but all of us, 
May the Lord help us. The next slide we go to speaks of the length. And the length of it, it's timeless and changeless. It never began and it never ends. Praise God. And you just think of the extreme length that he went to to save us. We sang some of it about some of it this morning. But you see the extreme length that he went to. How that there was nothing that would hinder him from coming and dying for us. How about, our, how about the length of Christ's love in us? Does the length of Christ's love in us have boundaries? Do we have limitations when we're misunderstood, when we disagree, when someone has a different opinion, someone has a different interpretation, someone has a different political belief, someone has a different personality? We all have built in within us, in that old natural man, we all have instant preferences and prejudices. A person can walk into this room and immediately, based on our own experience, our preferences and prejudices, we have an evaluation of that person in our natural self. The love of Christ sees beyond that and sees them as a person, either a saint or a potential saint. And we want to be those that we have that, that great length there. And then the next one we go to, we see the height. The height is the glory that he takes us to, to be seated with him in the heavenlies. One brother described his love. It was like a spiral staircase that which the guiltiest may climb from the dark dungeon to the royal palace. Praise God. He's taken us out of that dark dungeon, brought us into a royal palace. What, what a height he's brought us into. You know, the greatest example of the height and depth of his love in a person is Jacob. You see the height of his love in the name Israel. You see the depth of his love in the name Jacob, the depth that he went to. Are we experiencing the height of his love? You know, the power of his love that frees us from everything that would drag us down to this world of discouragement. The power of that love that would set us free from the things of this world. The power of this, his love that would set us free from even the, the anger, the frustration and, and all when various, maybe a, there's a certain brother has a difficulty with, we have, we have with them. There's a certain one who uh, we just, we don't like. Uh, is, that, is the power of his love greater than that? That's, that's the testimony. There's a depth to his love. And that's the next slide. Uh, the depth he went down to to redeem us and raise us up. There's no sin so profound there's no despondency so low, and there's no misery so abject that he can't go down and bring us up into that. In Psalm 139, it speaks about how if we make our bed in hell or Sheol, behold, he's there. There's a depth of his love. that to, And I just think of that. He, how is the depth of our love uh, displayed? How about, how about to the dear one who's fallen again and again when we think they should know better? We still go down and reach, reach to help them come up. <laughs> I was um, talking with a brother this week, and he gave me a, a Chinese proverb. And he said, just because it takes three bowls of rice to fill one's stomach, it doesn't mean the first two bowls aren't working. Now, what does that mean? Maybe you're, you're trying to help somebody in a certain situation. And you help them one time, and you don't see a lot of reaction. Or act, you know, and you help them a second time, you don't see a lot of reaction. But then that third bowl, you see some response. It doesn't mean those first two times didn't count. After we go that extra mile for one, are we willing to go the extra second mile? Are we willing to go the extra third mile? That's the depth that God went to, to grab each one of us. And may we be willing to do that also. It's easy. I've experienced it in my own life of how, well, I tried one. I tried. They didn't respond. Well, what's God calling us to? Maybe he's calling us to respond again. In, uh, verse, back in verse 17, it talked about how Christ is he's dwelling in our hearts through faith. Do we really believe that there's no end to the breadth and length of his love and that there, there's the top, there's no end to the top and no end to the bottom. Do we really believe that? 
And then we have the question, how does the reality of this love get worked out in our life? How, how does it get worked out? Well, I'll ask this question. What was the greatest display of the love of Christ? And let's do the next slide. The greatest display of the love of Christ is the cross. That's how he, that is the greatest display. And Calvary, by, at Calvary, we see the, the Lord denying himself that not my will. And every time I, the more and more, if we want to enter into that love of Christ, there's this allowing that cross to work within us. When he touches, you know, I think about every time I read the Gospels, toward the end of the Gospels, when you come to usually the last couple of chapters of how much the Lord had to suffer, all he went through, that um, enduring love, I just start to, I get convicted. I see how shallow my love is. You see that, read those, it's a good habit. Go back and read the end of the Gospels. <laughs> that from Gethsemane on. I mean, you, throughout the whole Gospels we see his love. But then you come toward the end there. That greatest display of his love right there at Calvary. That's, uh, that's how this becomes reality. That love of Christ. Are we willing to do that. And if we're constrained by him, that's what Paul said in his testimony. I'm constrained by the love of Christ that I'm no longer living for myself, but for him who loved me and died for me. That's the cross. That's the cross working in reality within Paul to allow that love to come forth. And would the cross be working within us? You know, he's made every provision for us. When we have the situation that God has made, the things in life that he brings us into, He's made every provision for us in Christ. And he's given us not only his abundant love, but he's given us that abundant grace to come through. And one of the things we were challenged with in 2 Corinthians was not taking the grace of God in vain. Sometimes I hear believers say, I can't do this, I won't do that. And to me, I, uh, when I hear I can't, I want, that's a real challenge. Are we taking the grace of God in vain? Because there's love is there, his grace is there. It's simply us denying ourselves. I can't is tr is a true statement. I can't, but he can. And that's where our sentence needs to continue on. I can't love that one. I can't be with that one. I don't like that person. This and that. That's true. People we don't like. Sometimes they're hard to be with. But do we press on and say I can't, but God can. The love of Christ within me. Has a, has a breadth and a length and a height and a depth. And I'm going to prove God, prove that love to overcome. That's overcoming in his world and life. You know, we, we can, as I mentioned, how in this day and time he's doing a lot of shaking so that we can see everything that we've been trusting in and, and finding our security in. Um, and as we see that because of what we're going through in this day and time, we're seeing that we don't like change and also that there's, uh, even within an assembly, uh, at times, maybe some of our diversity has come forth in a way that we weren't, hadn't really seen before. We have every, a lot more, oh, you can take that down, I'm sorry. Uh, there's a lot more, um, we have a lot more thoughts and opinions than during so-called normal times. But during this 2020, a lot of various thoughts surface. A lot of various opinions come out. And a lot of various perspectives come. And we're not comfortable with diversity. We're not comfortable with change in ourself. But do we allow that love of Christ to help us through that? Do we allow that love of Christ to keep us through that? Or if not, we'll, what we can do, we can fall into the trap of judging one another, having preferences over one another. If someone has a certain perspective or a certain opinion on this, we say, well, I'm right, they're wrong. They just have a different perspective. Doesn't mean it's right or wrong. We say, well, you know, I can do this, I did this, I did that, therefore, am I more, do we say we're more spiritual than them? You know, we need to, it's, generally it's the little actions in life that can bring about division. And all that the enemy needs for that seed of division to come in is a little crack. Just a little crack, and that seed gets planted, and it can divide brothers and sisters. 
through various plenty. And we've had plenty of opportunities for, for that to occur. You know, whether you're talking about masks, everybody has opinions on masks, okay. You know, we're, whether you meet on Zoom or we don't, we're meeting in person. But praise God, we're meeting together. We're meeting together. Some are in person and some are in Zoom. Praise God for that. And we have some in our midst that are for Biden, some are for Trump. Praise God, because that's a challenge for us. You know, I'm so thankful that we're not 100% for Biden or 100% for Trump. You know, because all of a sudden when you start, that, because, that can become one's unity and oneness. Anything other than Christ that unites us has to be shattered. Now, and, and we're entitled, ones are entitled to have different opinions from a political perspective. You know, we might not understand that, but does the love of Christ hold us through that? You know, praise God. You know, we have, sometimes we'll have a young saint, they'll ask to sing a chorus. Um, us older ones, do we think, well, am I going to sing that, or is that just too shallow? I'm not going to sing that song. We, I'm too spiritual to sing it. Or maybe an older person asks for a hymn, and a younger person says, oh, that's so dead, I'm not going to sing that. You know, if we're honest, we've all, we have these thoughts and impressions when, when ones have uh, asked for various songs, prayers, or various things. Can we rise above our thoughts and prejudices? And really, even in that saying, sing for the sake of the love of Christ. Sing for the sake of the unity that we have. Sing for the sake of preserving the unity and the bond of peace. For the testimony of that, that we can go on together. As I mentioned, most of these things, they're not major issues that are gonna that bring about division. It's just these small things that, that can creep in and all of a sudden it can become something big. But may the may the actions of others not impact our hearts. So often the actions of others impact how we think. The actions of others can come in. I'm not speaking now of actions of others in the world. I'm speaking about among brothers and sisters. You know, we not don't allow the, the actions of a brother or a sister uh, to impact the love of Christ in our hearts. But would we rise above that and really, uh, really see that what God is doing in this day and time, he's shattering all of our little comfort zones. Our little box that we had uh, that said God operates in this way is being shattered. And I praise God. And that's why I'm so thankful for this year. Now I just need to go ahead and wrap it up, but May we see that his heart of love is so much better than our petty little things. These petty little things at times that we make so big, may his heart of love just overwhelm us that we can let those things go. And as to reiterate, we do know, we need to know about his teaching. We need to know about his heart and his purpose. But we need for that vision to become reality within our hearts and lives by the love of Christ being worked out within us in a fuller and greater way, that we could enter in to being really rooted and grounded in his love, rooted and grounded in a, in a way that we would be the testimony he's calling us to be, that we would be those that would display in life the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of his love. We would be those that don't take the grace of God in vain. And to me, this is one of the reasons that Paul concludes uh, this prayer with these two wonderful verses in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. As we allow that love of Christ to really be working within us, he again returns and gives God the glory. I will just close with these two verses. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. You know, praise God for that. We can, the Lord can touch us and we, we, we see the impossible. And we ask for something. He goes beyond what we ask or think. Because there's a, according to the power that works in us, that power of his life, the power of his love, there is a power that has overcome death. There's a power that is seated on the throne, living within us. And it's all for his glory. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Because when the love of Christ is seen in our hearts and in our lives, when the testimony of Jesus, when we as an assembly, when we as a people of God are known by the love of Christ, 
He receives the glory because they're not noticing us. One of the ground, I was talking with someone recently, I heard something how it's wonderful how when you serve and you're not noticed. That's, that's, there's, a, there's a beauty there. Some, when they serve, love to be noticed. Now, it's a beauty when you serve and you're not noticed. When that love of Christ is formed and lived out in our hearts and lives, we're not noticed we're, because they see Christ. And we're just there. And that's what brings Him glory. That's what brings Him honor. You know, that's, what we're all, that's what we're here for, brothers and sisters. So... In this day of great, where there's great shaking and battle, may we just even stop for a while and reflect in a fresh way upon that love of Christ and allow it to be touching the areas in our life. And when the Spirit is convicting us, will we take the time to allow that conviction to work deep within us, to set us free from anything else in our hearts and lives that we're trusting or finding comfort in? Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful for you first loving us. Lord, we're thankful how in your love you reached down and you redeemed each one of us. And Lord, we're thankful how your love never ends. You're continuing day by day to work within us. And Lord, I'm thankful too that you can't love us any more than you already have. And may we learn to be recipients in a fuller and greater way of that great love, which would all return to your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.